From the Conference Center at Temple Square in Salt Lake City, this is the Sunday afternoon session of the 189th Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, with speakers selected from the general authorities and general officers of the church. Music for this session is provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. This broadcast is furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. President Dallin H. Oaks, first counselor in the first presidency of the church, will conduct this session. Brothers and sisters, we welcome you to the Sunday afternoon session of the 198th Semiannual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. President Russell M. Nelson, who presides at the conference, has asked me to conduct this session. We extend our greetings to members of the church and friends everywhere who are participating in these proceedings by radio, television, the internet, or satellite transmission. The music for this session will be by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square, under the direction of Mac Wilberg and Ryan Murphy, with Richard Elliott at the organ. The choir will open this meeting by singing, Come Ye Children of the Lord. The invocation will then be offered by Elder Jack N. Gerard of the Seventy.
dear Father in heaven, as we assemble around the world at this time for the final session of this general conference, we express unto thee our deepest love and gratitude for the richness of the teachings of the prophets, seers, and revelators in our day. We are grateful, Father, for the witness of the Holy Ghost that enlightens our minds, quickens our understandings, that we may comprehend that which we have been taught, that as we listen and act, that we might draw closer to Thee, we may become more like Thy Son, our elder brother, even Jesus Christ. We thank Thee, Father, for Thy Son, for His atoning sacrifice, for what it means for each of us, has made possible our return to live with Thee once again. We pray now for, throughout this session, and in the coming days, months, and years, that we might sink deep into our hearts and our minds the things which we have felt, the things which we have learned, that we might change, that we might repent, that we might indeed become. We express our love and gratitude and do so in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The choir will now favor us with I Stand All Amazed. After the singing, we will hear from President Henry B. Eyring, second counselor in the First Presidency. He will be followed by Elder Hans T. Boom of the 70. We will then hear from President M. Russell Ballard, who is the acting president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Elder Peter M. Johnson of the 70 will then address us.
My dear brothers and sisters, I have prayed for the power to help you in your personal search for happiness. Some might feel happy enough already, yet surely no one would reject the offer of more happiness. Anyone would be eager to accept a guaranteed offer of lasting happiness. That is what our Heavenly Father, His beloved Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost have offered you and me. Every child of Heavenly Father who now lives will live or ever has lived in this world. That offer is sometimes called the plan of happiness. It was so called by the prophet Alma as he taught his son, who was mired in the misery of sin. Alma knew that wickedness could never be happiness for his son or for any child of Heavenly Father. He taught his son that increasing in holiness was the only path to happiness. He made it plain that greater holiness is made possible through the atonement of Jesus Christ, cleansing and perfecting us. Only by faith in Jesus Christ, continuing repentance, and keeping covenants are we able to claim the lasting happiness we all yearn to experience and retain. My prayer for you today is that I may help you understand that greater happiness comes from greater personal holiness so that you will act upon that belief. I will then share what I know for myself about what we can do to qualify for that gift of becoming ever more holy. The scriptures teach us that among other things, we can be sanctified or become more holy when we exercise faith in Christ demonstrate our, by obedience and repent and sacrifice for Him, receive sacred ordinances, and keep our covenants with Him. Qualifying for the gift of holiness requires humility, meekness, and patience. One experience of wanting more holiness came for me in the Salt Lake Temple. I entered the temple for the first time having been told little of what to expect in a temple. I had seen the words on the building, holiness to the Lord and the house of the Lord. I felt a great sense of anticipation, yet I wondered if I was prepared to enter. My mother and father walked ahead of me as we entered the temple. We were asked to show our recommends certifying our worthiness. My parents knew the man at the recommend desk, so they lingered a moment to speak with him. I went ahead, alone, into a large space where everything was sparkling white. I looked up at a ceiling so high above me that it seemed an open sky. In that moment, a clear impression came to me that I had been there before. But then I heard a very soft voice. It was not my own. The softly spoken words in my mind were these. You have never been here before. You are remembering a moment before you were born. You were in a place, a sacred place like this. You felt the Savior was about to come into the place where you stood. 
and you felt happiness because you were eager to see him, close quote. That experience in the Salt Lake Temple lasted only a moment. Yet the memory of it still brings peace, joy, and quiet happiness. I learned many lessons that day. One was that the Holy Ghost speaks in a still, small voice. I can hear him when there is spiritual peace in my heart. He brings a feeling of happiness and assurance that I am becoming more holy and that always brings the happiness I felt in those first moments in a temple of God. You have observed in your own life and in the lives of others the miracle of happiness coming from growing holiness, becoming more like the Savior. In recent weeks, I have been at the bedside of people who could face death with full faith in the Savior and with happy countenances. One was a man surrounded by his family. He and his wife were ch chatting quietly as my son and I entered the bedroom. I had known them for many years. I had seen the Atonement of Jesus Christ work in their lives and in the lives of their family members. They had together chosen to end medical efforts to prolong his life. There was a quiet feeling as he spoke to us. He smiled as he expressed gratitude for the gospel and its purifying effects on him and the family he loved. He spoke of his happy years of service in the temple. At this man's request, my son anointed his head, head with consecrated oil. I sealed the anointing. As I did, I had a clear impression to tell him that he would soon see his Savior face to face. I promised him that he would feel happiness, love, and the Savior's approval. He, he smiled warmly as we left. His last words to me were, tell Kathy I love her. <laughs> My wife Kathleen over many years had encouraged generations of his family to accept the Savior's invitation to come unto him, make deep and sacred and keep sacred covenants, and so qualify for the happiness that comes as a result of that greater holiness. He died hours later. Within weeks of his passing, his widow brought a gift to my wife and me. She smiled as we talked. She said pleasantly, I expected that I would feel sad and lonely. I feel so happy. Do you think that's all right? <laughs> Knowing how much she loved her husband and how both of them had, had come to know, love, and serve the Lord, I told her that her feelings of happiness were a promised gift because she had, by her faithful service, been made more holy. Her holiness had qualified her for that happiness. Now, some listening today may be wondering, why do I not feel the peace and happiness promise to those who have been faithful? I have been faithful through terrible adversity, but I don't feel happiness. Even the prophet Joseph Smith faced this test. He prayed for relief when he was confined in a jail in Liberty, Missouri. He had been faithful to the Lord. He had grown in holiness, yet he felt happiness had been denied. The Lord taught him the lesson of patience we all will need at some time and perhaps for long periods in our mortal testing. Here is the Lord's message to his faithful and suffering 
prophet. Open quote. And if thou should be cast into the pit or into the hands of murderers, and the sentence of death passed upon thee, if thou be cast into the deep, if the billowing surge compire, conspire against thee, if fierce winds become thine enemy, if the heavens gather blackness and all the elements combine to hedge up the way, and above all, if the very jaws of hell shall gape open the mouth wide after thee, know thou, my son, <laughs> that all these things shall give thee experience and shall be for thy good. The Son of Man hath descended below them all. Art thou greater than he? Therefore, hold on the way, and the priesthood shall remain with thee, for their bounds are set, they cannot pass. Thy days are known, and thy years shall not be numbered less. Therefore, fear not what man can do, for God shall be with you forever and ever." That was the same instructive lesson the Lord gave Job, who paid a heavy price to allow the Atonement to make him more holy. We know that Job was holy from the introduction we have of him. Open quote. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect, was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil, close quote. Then Job lost his wealth, his family, even his health. You might remember that Job doubted that his greater holiness, gained through great adversity, had qualified him for greater happiness. It seemed to Job that holiness had only brought misery. Yet the Lord gave Job the same correcting lesson he gave Joseph Smith. He let Job see his heartbreaking situation with spiritual eyes. He said, Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundation? of the earth. Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, then after Job repented of calling God unfair, Job was permitted to see his trials in a higher and holier way. He had repented. Quote, then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore I abhor myself, and repent in dust and ashes. After Job repented, and so became more holy. The Lord blessed him beyond all he had lost. But perhaps the greatest blessing for Job was to have increased in holiness through adversity and repentance. He was qualified to have greater happiness in the days he had yet to live. Greater holiness will not come simply by asking for it. It will come by doing what is needed for God to change us. President Russell M. Nelson has given what seems to me the best counsel of how to move along the covenant path to greater holiness. He pointed the way when he urged, open quote, experience the strengthening power of daily repentance 
of doing and being a little better each day. When we choose to repent, we choose to change. We allow the Savior to transform us into the best version of ourselves. We choose to grow spiritually and receive joy, the joy of redemption in Him. When we choose to repent, we choose to become more like Jesus Christ. President Nelson went on to give us this encouragement in our efforts to become holier. Open quote, the Lord does not expect perfection from us at this point, but he does expect us to become increasingly pure. Daily repentance is the pathway to purity. President Dallin H. Oaks, in an earlier conference address, also helped me see more clearly how we grow in holiness and how we can know we are moving toward it. He said, open quote, how do we achieve spirituality? How do we attain that degree of holiness where we can have the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost? How do we come to view the, and evaluate things of this world with the perspective of eternity? Close quote. President Oaks's answer begins with greater faith in Jesus Christ as our loving Savior. That leads us to seek forgiveness every day and to remember Him every day by keeping His commandments. That greater faith in Jesus Christ comes as we feast daily on His Word. The hymn, More Holiness Give Me, suggests a way to pray for help in becoming more holy. The author of that music wisely suggests that the holiness we seek is a gift from a loving God granted over time after all we can do. You remember the last verse. More purity give me, more strength to overcome, more freedom from earth stains, more longing for home, more fit for the kingdom, more used would I be, more blessed and holy, more Savior like thee. Whatever our personal circumstances, wherever we may be on the covenant path home, may our prayers for greater holiness be answered. I know that as our petition is granted, our happiness will increase. It may come slowly but it will come. I have that assurance from a loving Heavenly Father and His beloved Son, Jesus Christ. I testify that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God, that President Russell M. Nelson is our living prophet today. God the Father lives and lo loves us and wants us to come home to Him in families. Our loving Savior invites us to follow Him on our journey there, they have prepared the way. In the sacred name of Jesus Christ, amen. In 2016, the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square came to visit the Netherlands and Belgium. And since I was involved in that exciting event, I had the opportunity to enjoy their performance twice. During their performance, I was thinking about what a tremendous undertaking it was to move a choir of that size. My mind was drawn to the big gong, which was difficult and probably costly to ship over in comparison with the violin, the trumpet, or other instruments you could easily carry under your arm. But looking at the actual involvement of this gong, it was only hit a few times whereas the other smaller instruments were involved for most of the concert. I reflected that without the sound of the gong, the performance would not be the same. And so the effort had to be made to move this big gong all the way across the ocean. Sometimes we might feel that we are, like that gong, only good enough to play a minor part in the performance. But let me tell you that your sound is making all the difference. We need all instruments. Some of us learn easily, 
and do very well in school, while others have artistic talents. Some design and build things or nurse, protect or teach others. We are all needed to bring color and meaning to this world. To those who feel they do not have anything to contribute or believe that they are of no importance or consequence to anybody, to others that might feel that they are on top of the world and anybody in between, I'd like to address this message. Wherever you are on the path of life, some of you might feel so overburdened that you do not even consider yourself on that path. I want to invite you to step out of the darkness into the light. The gospel light will provide warmth and healing and will help you understand who you really are and what your purpose in life is. Some of us have been wandering on forbidden paths, trying to find happiness there. We are invited by a loving Heavenly Father to walk the path of discipleship and to return to Him. He loves us <clears throat> with a perfect love. What is the way? The way is to help each other understand who we are by ministering to each other. To me, ministering is exercising divine love. In that way, we create an environment where both the giver and the receiver obtain a desire to repent. In other words, we change direction and come closer to and become more like our Savior, Jesus Christ. For instance, there is no need to constantly tell our spouse or children how they can improve. They know that already. It is in creating this environment of love that they will be empowered to make the necessary changes in their lives and become better people. In this way, repentance becomes a daily process of refining that might include apologizing for poor behavior. I remember and still experience situations where I have been too quick to judge or too slow to listen. And at the end of the day, during my personal prayer, I felt loving counsel from heaven to repent and to become better. The loving environment first created by my parents, brother and sisters, and later by my wife, children and friends, has helped me to become a better person. We all know where we can do better. There is no need to repeatedly remind each other, but there is a need to love and minister to each other, and in doing so, provide a climate of willingness to change. In this same environment, we are learning who we really are and what our role will be in this last chapter of the world's history prior to the second coming of the Savior. If you are wondering about your part, I would like to invite you to find a place where you can be alone and ask Heavenly Father to make known to you which part to play. The answer will probably come gradually and then more clearly when we have set our feet more firmly on the covenant and ministering path. We are experiencing some of the same difficulties that Joseph Smith confronted while he was in the, in the midst of a war of words and tumult of opinions. As we read in his own account, he often said to himself, what is to be done? Who of all these parties are right? Or are they all wrong together? If any one of them be right, which one is it? And how shall I know it? With the knowledge he found in the epistle of James, which stated, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that give it to all men, liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. Joseph at length came to the determination to ask of God. We further read that it was the first time in his life that he had made such an attempt, for amidst all his anxieties, he had never as yet made the attempt to pray vocally. And so it can be for us the very first time we address our Maker in a way that we have never done before. Because of Joseph's attempt, Heavenly Father and His Son Jesus Christ appeared to him, calling him by name. And as a result, we have a much clearer understanding of who we are and that we really do matter. We further read that in his tender teenage years, Joseph was persecuted by those who ought to have been his friends and who were supposed to have treated him kindly. And so we might expect some opposition as we are living a life of discipleship. 
If you currently feel you are not able to be part of the Augusta and the, and the path of repentance appears difficult to you, please know that if we keep at it, the burden will be taken from our shoulders and there will be light again. Heavenly Father will never leave us when we reach for him. We can fall and get up and he will help us brush off the dirt from our knees. Some of us are wounded, but the first aid kit of the Lord has bandages big enough to cover all of our wounds. So it is that love, that perfect love that we also call charity or the pure love of Christ, which is needed in our homes, where parents minister to their children and children to their parents. Through that love, hearts will be changed and desires born to do His will. It is that love that is needed in our dealings with each other as children of our Heavenly Father and as members of His Church that will enable us to include all the musical instruments in our orchestras so we will be able to perform gloriously with the angelic choirs of heaven when the Savior comes again. It is that love, that light, that needs to shine and brighten our surroundings as we go about our daily lives. People will notice the light and will be drawn to it. That is the kind of missionary work that will draw others to come and see, come and help, and come and stay. Please, when you have received your, your witness about this great work and our part in it, let us rejoice together with our beloved Prophet, Prophet Joseph Smith, who declared, for I had seen a vision, I knew it, and I knew that God knew it, and I could not deny it. I testify to you that I know who I am, and I do know who you are. We are all children of a Heavenly Father who loves us, and He did not send us here to fail, but to return gloriously to Him, that we may all come to understand our part in this great ministering work so that we will become more like Him when He comes again, is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters, as, I, as October General Conference approached last year, I prepared my conference talk to highlight the 100th anniversary of the vision of the spirit world given to President Joseph S. Smith on October 3, 1918. A few days after I had submitted my talk for translation, my beloved eternal companion, Barbara, completed her mortal probation and passed in to the world of the Spirit. As the days have turned into weeks and then months and now a year since Barbara's passing, I find myself more fully appreciative of the scripture, thou shalt live together in love insomuch that thou shalt weep for the loss of them that die. Barbara and I were blessed to live together for 67 years, but I've learned in a very real way what it means to weep for the loss of those we love. Oh, how I love and miss her. I suppose most of us fail to fully appreciate what others do for us until they're gone. I knew Barbara was always busy, but I did not fully understand the constant family, church, and community demands upon her time. There were daily consecrated efforts repeated thousands of times through the years that kept our family functioning. And through it all, no one in our family ever heard her raise her voice or say an unkind word. Floods of memories have washed over me this past year. I've thought about the physically demanding choice she made to be the mother of seven children. Being a homemaker was the only career she ever wanted, and she was in every aspect a consummate professional. Often I've wondered how she kept track of our children and me. Meal preparation alone was truly daunting task, not to mention activities such as doing the mountains of laundry our families generated every week, 
keeping shoes and appropriately sized clothing on the children. We all turned to her on a myriad of other issues that were important to us. And because they were important to us, they were also important to her. She was, in a word, magnificent as a wife, as a mother, as a friend, as a neighbor, and as a daughter of God. Now that she's moved on, I'm happy that I chose to sit next to her when I came home from the office during the last few months of her life as we watched the endings of some of her favorite musicals over and over again because Alzheimer's would not allow her to remember that she had seen them just the afternoon before. Memories of those special hand-holding sessions are now very, very precious to me. Brothers and sisters, please do not miss an opportunity to look into the eyes of your family members with love. Children and parents reach out to each other and express your love and appreciation. Like me, some of you may wake up one day to discover that the time for such important communication has passed. Live each day together with hearts filled with the gratitude, good memories, service, and much love. During this past year, I've pondered more intently than ever more ever before about our Heavenly Father's plan in teaching His son Corianton, Alma referred to it, as the great plan of happiness. The word that keeps coming to my mind now when I consider the plan is reunion. It's a plan designed by our loving Father in heaven that has at its center the grand and glorious possibilities of family reunion, of eternally reuniting husbands and wives, parents and children, generation upon generation in the household of God. That thought brings me comfort, the assurance that I will be with Barbara again. Although she physically suffered toward the end of her life, her spirit was strong, noble, and pure. She had prepared herself in all things so that when the day comes, she can stand before the pleasing bar of God, full of confidence and peaceful assurance. But here I am, in two days, 91 years old, and I'm still wondering, am I ready? Am I doing everything I need to do to be able to hold her hand again? The most simple, basic certainty of life is this. We are all going to die. Whether we die old or young, easy or hard, wealthy or indigent, beloved or lonely, nobody escapes death. A few years ago, President Gordon B. Hinckley said something that is particularly meaningful about this. How sweet is the assurance? How comforting is the peace that comes from the knowledge that if we marry right and live right, our relationship will continue, notwithstanding the certainty of death and the passage of time." Close quote. I certainly married right. Of that, there can be no doubt. But that isn't enough, according to President Hinckley. I also have to live right. Today, living right can be a pretty confusing concept especially if you spend much time on social media where any voice can declare real truths or false concepts about God and His plan for His children. Thankfully, members of the Church have eternally true gospel principles to know how to live so that we might be better prepared when we must die. Just a few months before I was born, my apostle grandfather, Elder Melvin J. Ballard, gave a talk that for some people captured the essence 
of what it means to live right. The talk was titled, The Struggle for the Soul. His talk focused on the ongoing battle between our physical body and our eternal spirits. He said, the greatest conflict that any man or woman will ever have will be the battle that is had with self. Explaining that Satan, the enemy of our souls, attacks us through the lusts, the appetites, the ambitions of the flesh. So the primary battle is between our divine and spiritual nature and the carnal natural man." Close quote. Brothers and sisters, remember, we can receive spiritual help through the influence of the Holy Ghost that can teach you all things. Help can also come through the power and blessings of the priesthood. Now I ask all of us for a moment, how is this battle going with each one of you? President David O. McKay said, man's earthly existence is but a test as to whether he will concentrate his efforts, his mind, his soul upon the things which contribute to the comfort and gratification of his physical nature, or whether he will make as his life's purpose the acquisition of spiritual qualities." Close quote. This battle between our carnal and our spiritual natures isn't a new thing. In his final sermon to his people, King Benjamin taught that the natural man is an enemy to God and has been from the fall of Adam and will be forever and ever unless he yields to the enticings of the Holy Spirit and putteth off the natural man and becometh a saint through the atonement of Christ the Lord. The Apostle Paul taught that they are, that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. It seems clear to me that one of the most important things we can learn in this life is how to emphasize our eternal spiritual nature and control our evil desires. This should not be that difficult. After all, our spirit has been around a lot longer than our physical body. Before this earth was formed, we lived in the spirit world as sons and daughters of heavenly parents who loved us and continue to love us now. And yes, we did have to make life-changing decisions and choices in that pre-mortal realm. Every person who has ever lived or ever will live on this planet made an essential decision to choose to accept Heavenly Father's plan for our salvation. So we all came to Earth with a proven track record of successful, successful spiritual nature and eternal destiny. Think about that for a moment. This is who you and I really are and who you have always been, a son or a daughter of God with spiritual roots in eternity and a future overflowing with infinite possibilities. You are first and foremost and always a spiritual being. And so when one chooses to put our carnal nature Ahead of our spiritual nature, we are choosing something that is contrary to our real, true, authentic spiritual selves. Still, there is no question that flesh and earthly impulses complicate the decision-making with a veil of forgetfulness drawn between the pre-mortal spirit world and this mortal world we can lose sight of our relationship to God and our spiritual nature, and our carnal nature can give priority to what we want right now. 
Learning to choose the things of the Spirit over the things of the flesh is one of the primary reasons why this earthly experience is part of Heavenly Father's plan. It's also why the plan is built upon the solid, sure foundation of the Atonement of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, so that our sins, including the errors we make when we yield to the flesh, can be overcome through constant repentance, and we can live spiritually focused. Now is the time to control our bodily appetites, to compel to comply with the spiritual doctrine of Christ. That is why we must not procrastinate the day of our repentance. Repentance, therefore, becomes an indispensable weapon in our battle over self. Just last General Conference, President Nelson referred to this battle and reminded us that, quote, when we choose to repent, we choose to change. We allow the Savior to transform us into the best version of ourselves. We choose to grow spiritually and receive joy, the joy of redemption in Him. When we choose to repent, we choose to become more like Jesus Christ." Close quote. You know, every night as I review my day in prayer with my Father in Heaven, I ask to be forgiven if I did anything wrong and promise to try to be better tomorrow. I believe this regular daily repentance helps my spirit remind my body who is in charge of me. Another resource is the weekly opportunity we all have to refresh ourselves spiritually by partaking of the sacrament in remembrance of the Atonement and the perfect love that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has for us. Brothers and sisters, I encourage you to slow down a bit and think about where you are now in subjugating your carnal nature and empowering your divine spiritual nature. So when the time comes, you may pass into the spirit world to a joyful reunion with your loved ones. For this, for all of us, I humbly pray in the sacred name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. amen. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, thank you. Thank you for all you do to become and to help others become true followers of Jesus Christ and enjoy the blessings of the Holy Temple. Thank you for your goodness. You are wonderful. You are beautiful. It is my prayer that we will recognize the confirming influence of the Holy Ghost as we come to fully understand that we are children of God. The family, a proclamation to the world, states, all human beings, male and female, are created in the image of God. Each is a beloved spirit son or daughter of heavenly parents. And as such, each has a divine nature and destiny. We are choice spirits who is reserved to come forth in the fullness of times, to take part in laying the foundations of the great Latter-day work. President Russell M. Nelson declared, you were taught in a spirit world to prepare you for anything and everything you would encounter during this latter part of these latter days. That teaching endures within you. You are elect sons and daughters of God. You have the power to overcome the adversary. The adversary, however, is aware of who you are. He knows of your divine heritage and seeks to limit your earthly and heavenly potential by using the three Ds, deception, distraction, discouragement. The adversary used the tool of deception in the days of Moses. The Lord declared to Moses, Behold, thou art my son, I have a work for thee, and thou art in the similitude of my only begotten. Shortly after this glorious vision, Satan attempted to deceive Moses. The words he used are interesting. Moses, son of man, worship me? The deception was not only in the invitation to worship Satan, but the deception was also in the way he described Moses as a son of man. 
Remember, the Lord just told Moses he was a son of God, created in similitude of the only begotten. The adversary was relentless in his attempts to deceive Moses, but Moses resisted, saying, Depart from me, Satan, for this one God only will I worship, which is the God of glory. Moses remembered who he was, a son of God. The Lord's words to Moses apply to you and to me. We are created in God's own image, and he has a work for us to do. The adversary attempts to deceive by having us forget who we truly are. If we do not understand who we are, then it is difficult to recognize who we can become. The adversary also attempts to distract us away from Christ and his covenant path. Elder Ronald A. Rasband shared the following. The adversary design is to distract us from spiritual witnesses, while the Lord desires to enlighten and to engage us in his work. In our day, there are many distractions, including Twitter, Facebook, virtual reality games, and much more. These technological advances are amazing, but if we are not careful, they can distract us from fulfilling our divine potential. Using them appropriately can bring forth the power of heaven and allow us to witness miracles as we seek to gather scattered Israel on both sides of the veil. Let us be careful and not casual in our use of technology. Continually seek for ways that technology can draw us closer to the Savior and allow us to accomplish His work as we prepare for His second coming. Lastly, the adversary desires for us to become discouraged. We may get discouraged when we compare ourselves to others or feel we're not living up to expectations, including our own. When I started my doctoral program, I felt discouraged. The program accepted only four students that year, and the other students were brilliant. They had higher test scores, more work experience at senior management positions, and they exude confidence in their abilities. After my first two weeks in a program, feelings of discouragement and doubt began to take hold, almost overwhelming me. I decided that if I was going to complete this four-year program, I would finish reading the Book of Mormon each semester. Each day as I read, I recognized the Savior's declaration that the Holy Ghost will teach me all things and will bring all things to my remembrance. It reaffirmed who I am as a son of God, reminded me not to compare myself with others, and gave me the confidence in my divine role to succeed. My dear friends, please do not let anyone steal your happiness. Do not compare yourself to others, and please remember the loving words of the Savior. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So how do we do it? How do we find this peace, remember who we are, and overcome the three Ds of the adversary? First, remember that the first and great commandment is to love God with our heart, might, mind, and strength. All that we do should be motivated by our love for Him and for His Son. As we develop our love for them by keeping their commandments, our capacity to love ourselves and to love others will increase. We will begin to serve family and friends and neighbors because we will see them as the Savior sees them, as sons and daughters of God. Second, pray unto the Father in the name of Jesus Christ every day, every day, every day. It is through prayer that we can feel the love of God and show our love for Him. Through prayer, we express gratitude and ask for the strength and the courage to submit our wills to God's and to be guided and directed in all things. I encourage you to pray unto the Father with all the energy of heart that ye may be filled with this love, that ye may become the sons and daughters of God, that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Third, read and study the Book of Mormon every day, every day, every day. My Book of Mormon studies tends to go better when I read with a question in mind. As we study with a question, we can receive revelation and recognize that the prophet Joseph Smith spoke truth when he declared, the Book of Mormon is the most correct of any book on earth 
and a man or a woman would get nearer to God by abiding by his precepts than by any other book. The Book of Mormon contains the words of Christ and helps us remember who we are. Lastly, prayerfully partake of the sacrament every week, every week, every week. It is through covenants and priesthood ordinances, including the sacrament, that the power of godliness is manifest in our lives. Elder David A. Bednar taught, the ordinance of the sacrament is a holy and repeated invitation to repent sincerely and to be renewed spiritually. The act of partaking of the sacrament in and of itself does not remit sin, but as we prepare conscientiously and participate in this holy ordinance with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, then the promise is that we may always have the spirit of the Lord to be with us. As we humbly partake of the sacrament, we remember Jesus suffering in that sacred garden called Gethsemane and his sacrifice on the cross. We express gratitude to the Father for sending his only begotten Son, our Redeemer, and show our willingness to keep his commandments and to always remember him. There is a spiritual enlightenment associated with the sacrament. It is personal, it is powerful, and it is needed. My friends, I promise, as we strive to love God with all our heart, pray in the name of Jesus Christ, study the Book of Mormon, and prayerfully partake of the sacrament, we will have the ability with the strength of the Lord to overcome the deceptive practices of the adversary, to minimize distractions that limit our divine potential, and to resist the discouragement that diminishes our capacity to feel the love of our Heavenly Father and His Son. We will come to fully understand who we are as sons and daughters of God. Brothers and sisters, I share with you my love and I declare unto you my witness that I know Heavenly Father lives and Jesus is the Christ. I love them. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is God's kingdom upon the earth and we have a divine appointment to gather Israel and to prepare the world for the second coming of the Messiah. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. The congregation will now join the choir in the singing, Let Us All Press On. After the singing, we will hear from Elders Ulysses Suarez and Neil L. Anderson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. This is the 189th semi-annual general conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints.
Dear brothers and sisters, we have received wonderful teachings from our leaders during these last two days. I testify to you that if we strive to apply these inspired and timely teachings in our lives, the Lord, through His grace, will help each of us carry our cross and make our burdens light. While in the vicinity of Caesarea Philippi, the Savior revealed to His disciples what He would suffer at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and scribes in Jerusalem. He specifically taught them about His death and glorious resurrection. At that point in time, His disciples did not completely understand His divine mission on earth. Peter himself, when he heard what he, the Savior had said, took him aside and rebuked him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. To help his disciples to understand that devotion to his work includes submission and suffering, the Savior emphatically declared, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Through this declaration, the Savior emphasized that all those who are willing to follow him need to deny themselves and control their desires, appetites, and passions, sacrificing everything, even life itself if necessary, being entirely submissive to the will of the Father, just as He did. This is, in fact, the price to be paid for the salvation of a soul. Jesus purposely and metaphorically used the symbol of a cross to help His disciples better understand what sacrifice and devotion to the Lord's cause would truly mean. The image of a cross was well known among His disciples and the inhabitants of the Roman Empire because Romans forced victims of crucifixion to publicly carry their own cross or cross being to the place where their execution would occur. It was only after the Savior's resurrection that the disciples' minds were open to understand all that had been written about Him and what would be required of them from that time on. In the same fashion, all of us, brothers and sisters, need to open our minds and our hearts in order to, fully, to more fully understand the relevance of taking upon ourselves our crosses and following Him. We learn through the scriptures that those who wish to take their cross upon themselves love Jesus Christ in such a way that they deny themselves of all ungodliness and of every worldly lust and keep His commandments. Our determination to cast off all that is contrary to God's will and to sacrifice all we are asked to give and to strive to follow His teachings will help us to endure in the path of Jesus Christ's gospel, even in the face of tribulation, weakness of our souls, or the social pressure and worldly philosophies that oppose His teachings. For example, for those who have not yet found an eternal companion and may be feeling lonely and hopeless, or for those who have been divorced and feel abandoned and forgotten, I assure you that accepting the Savior's invitation of taking upon yourselves your crosses and following Him means continuing with faith on the Lord's path maintaining a pattern of dignity and not indulging in worldly habits that will eventually take away our hope in God's love and mercy. The same principles apply to those of you who are experiencing same-gender attraction and feel discouraged and helpless. And maybe for this reason, some of you are feeling that the gospel of Jesus Christ is not for you anymore. If that's the case, I want to assure you that there is always hope in God the Father and in His plan of happiness, in Jesus Christ and in His atoning sacrifice and in living their loving commandments, in His perfect wisdom, power, justice, and mercy, 
the Lord may seal us His, that we may be brought to His presence and have everlasting salvation, if we are steadfast and immovable in keeping the commandments and are always abounding in good works. To those who have committed serious sins, accepting the same invitation means, among other things, to humble yourself before God, to counsel with appropriate church leaders, and to repent and forsake your sins. This process will also bless all who are fighting against debilitating addictions, including opioids, drugs, alcohol, and pornography. Th taking these steps brings you closer to the Savior, who can ultimately free you from guilt, sorrow, and spiritual and physical slavery. Additionally, you may also desire to seek the support of your family, friends, and competent medical and counseling professionals. Please never give up after subsequent failures and consider yourself incapable of abandoning sins and overcoming addiction. You cannot afford to stop trying and thereafter continue in weakness and sin. Always strive to do your best, manifesting <clears throat> through your works the desire to cleanse the inner vessel as taught by the Savior. Sometimes solutions to certain challenges come after months and months of continuous effort. The promise found in the Book of Mormon that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do is applicable in these circumstances. Please remember that the Savior's gift of grace is not necessarily limited in time to after all we can do. We may receive His grace before, during, and after the time when we expand our own efforts. I testify that as we continually strive to overcome our challenges, God will bless us with the gifts of faith to be healed and of the working of miracles. He will do for us what we are not capable of doing for ourselves. Additionally, for those who feel bitter, angry, offended, or chained for, to sorrows for something you feel is undeserved, to take up one's cross and follow the Savior means to strive to lay aside these feelings and turn to the Lord so He can free us from this state of mind and help us to find peace. Unfortunately, if we hold on on these negative feelings and emotions, we may find ourselves living without the influence of the Lord's Spirit in our lives. We cannot repent for other people, but we can forgive them by refusing to be held hostage by those who have harmed us. The scriptures teach that there is a way out of these situations by inviting our Savior to help us to replace our stone hearts with new hearts. For this to happen, we need to come before the Lord with our weaknesses and implore His help and forgiveness, especially during the sacred moment when we partake of the sacrament each Sunday. May we choose to seek His help and take an important and difficult step by forgiving those who have hurt us so that our wounds may begin to heal. To heal. I promise you that in your doing so, your nights will be full of relief that comes from a mind at peace with the Lord. While in the Liberty Jail in 1839, the prophet Joseph Smith wrote an epistle to church members containing prophecies that are so very applicable in all these circumstances and situations. He wrote, all thrones and dominions, principalities and powers shall be revealed and set forth upon all who have endured valiantly for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, those who have taken upon themselves the name of the Savior, trusting in His promises and persevering to the end, will be saved and may dwell with God in a state of never-ending happiness. We all face adverse circumstances in our lives that make us feel sad, helpless, hopeless, and sometimes even weakened. 
Some of these feelings may lead us to question the Lord, why am I experiencing these situations? Or why are my expectations not met? After all, I am doing everything in my power to carry my cross and follow the Savior. My dear friends, we must remember that taking our cross upon ourselves includes being humble and trusting in God and in His infinite wisdom. We must acknowledge that He is aware of each of us and of our needs. It is also necessary to accept the fact that the Lord's timing is different than ours. Sometimes we seek for a blessing and set a time limit for the Lord to fulfill it. We cannot condition our faithfulness to Him by imposing upon Him a deadline for the answers to our desires. When we do this, we resemble the skeptical Nephites from ancient times who mocked their brethren by saying that the time was past for the fulfillment of the words spoken by Samuel the Lamanite, creating confusion among those who believed. We need to trust the Lord enough to be still and know that He is God that He knows all things, and that He is aware of each of us. I recently had the opportunity <clears throat> to minister to a widowed sister named Franca Calamasi, who is suffering from a debilitating illness. Sister Calamasi was the first member of her family to join the Restored Church of Jesus Christ. Although her husband was never baptized, he consented to meet with the missionaries and often attended church meetings. Despite these circumstances, Sister Calamasi remained faithful and raised her four children in the gospel of Jesus Christ. A year following her husband's passing, Sister Calamasi took her children to the temple and they participated in sacred ordinances and were sealed together as a family. The promises associated with these ordinances brought her much hope, joy, and happiness that helped her carry on in life. When the first symptoms of the disease began to appear, her bishop gave her a blessing. At that time, she told her bishop that she was ready to accept the Lord's will, expressing her faith to be healed as well as her faith to endure her illness to the end. During my visit, while holding Sister Calamasi's hand and looking into her eyes, I saw an angelic glow emanating from her countenance, reflecting her confidence in God's plan and her perfect brightness of hope in the Father's love and plan for her. I felt her firm determination to endure in her faith until the day by taking up until the end by taking up her cross despite the challenges she was facing. This sister's life is a testimony of Christ, a statement of her faith and devotion to him. Brothers and sisters, I want to testify to you that taking upon us our cross and following the Savior requires us to follow His example, to strive to become like Him, patiently facing the circumstances of life, denying and despising the appetites of the natural man, and waiting on the Lord. The psalmist wrote, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and He shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. He is our help and our shield. I testify to you that following our Master's footsteps and waiting on Him, who is the ultimate healer of our lives, will provide rest to our souls and make our burdens easy and light. Of these things, I testify in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I know what you're thinking. Just one more speaker, and we'll hear from President Nelson. <laughs> Hoping to keep you alert for a few minutes as we await our beloved prophet, I have selected a very appealing topic. My subject is fruit. 
With the color, texture, and sweetness of berries, bananas, watermelons, and mangoes, or a more exotic fruit like kiwano or pomegranate, fruit has long been a treasured delicacy. During his earthly ministry, the Savior compared good fruit to things of eternal worth. He said, Ye shall know them by their fruits. Every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. He encouraged us to gather fruit unto life eternal. In a vivid dream that we all know well in the Book of Mormon, the prophet Lehi finds himself in a dark and dreary wilderness. There is filthy water, a midst of darkness, strange roads and forbidden paths, as well as a rod of iron along a straight and narrow path leading to a beautiful tree with fruit that makes one happy. Recounting the dream, Lehi says, I did partake of the fruit. It was most sweet above all that I had ever tasted, and it filled my soul with exceedingly great joy. This fruit was more desirable than any other fruit. What does this tree with its most precious fruit symbolize? It represents the love of God and proclaims our Heavenly Father's marvelous plan of redemption. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This precious fruit symbolizes the wondrous blessings of the Savior's incomparable atonement. Not only will we live again following our mortality, but through our faith in Jesus Christ, our repentance and keeping the commandments, we can be forgiven of our sins and one day stand clean and pure before our Father and His Son. Partaking of the fruit of the tree also symbolizes that we embrace the ordinances and covenants of the restored gospel, being baptized, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, and entering the house of the Lord to be endowed with power from on high. Through the grace of Jesus Christ and by honoring our covenants, we receive the immeasurable promise of living with our righteous family throughout eternity. No wonder the angel described the fruit as the most joyous to the soul. It truly is. As we have all learned, even after savoring the precious fruit of the restored gospel, staying true and faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ is still not easily done. As has been said many times in this conference, we continue to face distractions and deceptions, confusion and commotion, enticements and temptations that attempt to pull our hearts away from the Savior and the joys and beauties we have experienced in following Him. Because of this adversity, Lehi's dream also includes a warning. On the other side of the river is a spacious building with people of all ages pointing their fingers, mocking and scoffing at the righteous followers of Jesus Christ. The people in the building are ridiculing and laughing at those keeping the commandments, hoping to discredit and deride their faith in Jesus Christ and in his gospel. And because of the verbal attacks of doubt and disdain launched at the believers, some of those who have tasted of the fruit begin to feel ashamed of the gospel they once embraced. The false allures of the world seduce them they turn away from the tree and from the fruit, and in the Lord's words, fall away into forbidden paths and are lost. In our world today, the adversary's construction crews are working overtime, hastily inflating the large and spacious building. The expansion has spread across the river, hoping to envelop our homes, while the pointers and the scoffers wail day and night on their internet megaphones. President Nelson explained, the adversary is quadrupling his efforts to disrupt testimonies and impede the work of the Lord. Let us remember Lehi's words, we heeded them not. Although we need not fear, we are to be on guard. 
At times, little things can upend our spiritual balance. Please, don't allow your questions, the insults of others, faithless friends, or unfortunate mistakes and disappointments to turn you away from the sweet, pure, and soul-satisfying blessings that come from the precious fruit of the tree. Keep your eyes and your heart centered on the Savior, Jesus Christ, and the eternal joy that comes only through Him. In June, my wife Kathy and I attended the funeral of Jason Hall. At the time of his passing, he was 48 years old and serving as an elders quorum president. Here are Jason's words about an event that changed his life. At age 15, I was in a diving accident. I broke my neck and was paralyzed from the chest down. I lost complete control of my legs and partial control of my arms. I could no longer walk, stand, or feed myself. I could barely breathe or speak. Dear Father in heaven, I begged, if I could only have my hands, I know I could make it. Please, Father, please keep my legs, Father. I just pray for the use of my hands. Jason never received the use of his hands. Can you hear the voices from the spacious building? Jason Hall, God does not hear your prayers. If God is a loving God, how could he leave you like this? Why have faith in Christ? Jason Hall heard their voices, but he did not heed them. Instead, he feasted upon the fruit of the tree. His faith in Jesus Christ became immovable. He graduated from the university and married Colette Coleman in the temple, describing her as the love of his life. After 16 years of marriage, another miracle, their precious son Coleman was born. How did they grow their faith? Colette explained, we trusted in God's plan and it gave us hope. We knew that Jason would in a future day be whole. We knew that God provided us a savior whose atoning sacrifice enables us to keep looking forward when we want to give up. Speaking at Jason's funeral, 10-year-old Coleman said his dad taught him, Heavenly Father has a plan for us. Earth life would be awesome, and we could live in families, but we would have to go through hard things, and we would make mistakes. Coleman continued, Heavenly Father sent his son, Jesus, to earth. His job was to be perfect, to heal people, to love them, and then to suffer for all of our pain, sorrows, and sins. Then he died for us. Then Coleman added, because he did this, Jesus knows how I feel right now. He continued, three days after Jesus died, he came alive again with his body perfect. This is important to me because I know that my dad's body will be perfect and we will be together as a family. Coleman concluded, every night since I was a baby, my dad said to me, Dad loves you, Heavenly Father loves you, and you're a good boy. President Russell M. Nelson described why the Hall family feels joy and hope. He said, the joy we feel has little to do with the circumstances of our lives and everything to do with the focus of our lives. When we focus, when the focus of our lives is on God's plan of salvation and Jesus Christ and his gospel, we can feel joy regardless of what is happening or not happening in our lives. Joy comes from and because of him. He is the source of all joy. If we look to the world, we will never know joy. Joy is the gift that comes from intentionally trying to live a righteous life as taught by Jesus Christ. If you have been without the fruit of the tree for some time, please know that the Savior's arms are always outstretched to you. He lovingly beckons, repent, 
and come unto me. His fruit is plentiful and always in season. It cannot be purchased with money, and no one who honestly desires it is denied. If you desire to return to the tree and taste the fruit once again, begin by praying to your Heavenly Father. Believe in Jesus Christ and the power of His atoning sacrifice. I promise you that as you look to the Savior in every thought, the fruit of the tree will be yours once again delicious to your taste, joyous to your soul, the greatest of all the gifts of God. Three weeks ago today, I saw the joy of the Savior's fruit on full display as Kathy and I attended the Lisbon Portugal Temple dedication. The truths of the restored gospel opened to Portugal in 1975 as religious freedom became available. Many noble saints who first tasted the fruit when there were no congregations, no chapels, and no temple closer than 1,000 miles rejoiced with us that the precious fruit of the tree is now in a house of the Lord in Lisbon, Portugal. How I honor and revere these Latter-day Saints who have kept their hearts riveted on the Savior. The Savior said, he that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. Speaking this morning to the members of the church across the world, President Nelson said, my dear brothers and sisters, you are living exemplars of the fruits that come from following the teachings of Jesus Christ. Then he added, I thank you. I love you. We love you, President Nelson. I am an eyewitness to the power of revelation that rests upon our dear President. He is the prophet of God. Like Lehi of old, President Russell M. Nelson beckons to us and all of God's family to come and partake of the fruit of the tree. May we have the humility and strength to follow his counsel. I humbly witness that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. His love, His power, and His grace bring all things of lasting worth. I so testify in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We express appreciation to all who have worked so diligently to prepare for these services. Our concluding speaker will be our beloved prophet, President Russell M. Nelson. The choir will then close this conference by singing, More Holiness Give Me. And the benediction will be offered by Douglas D. Holmes, first counselor in the Young Men General Presidency, and the conference will be adjourned. President Nelson. My beloved brothers and sisters, as we come to the end of this historic conference, we thank the Lord for inspiring the messages and the music that have edified us. We have truly enjoyed a spiritual feast. We know the restored gospel of Jesus Christ will bring hope and joy to people who will hear and heed his doctrine. We also know that each home can become a true sanctuary of faith, where peace, love, and the Spirit of the Lord may dwell. Of course, the crowning jewel of the Restoration is the Holy Temple. Its sacred ordinances and covenants are pivotal to preparing a people who are ready to welcome the Savior at His Second Coming. Presently, we have 166 dedicated temples and more are coming. An open house will be held prior to the dedication of each new and renovated temple. Many friends, not of our faith, will participate in tours of those temples. They will learn something about temple blessings, and some of those visitors will be moved upon to know more. Some will sincerely ask how they might qualify for the blessings of the temple. As members of the Church, we need to be prepared to answer their questions. 
We can explain that the blessings of the temple are available to any and all people who will prepare themselves. But before they can enter a dedicated temple, they need to qualify. The Lord wants all his children to partake of the eternal blessings available in his temple. He has directed what each person must do to qualify to enter his holy house. A good place for us to begin such a teaching opportunity is to call attention to the words etched on the temple's exterior. Holiness to the Lord, the house of the Lord. President Eyring's message today and many others have inspired us to become more holy. Each temple is a holy place. Each temple patron strives to become more holy. All requirements to enter the temple relate to personal holiness. To assess that readiness, each person who wants to enjoy the blessings of the temple will have two interviews. First, with a bishop, bishop counselor, or branch president. Second, with a stake or mission president or one of his counselors. In those interviews, several questions will be asked. Some of those questions have recently been edited for clarity. I would like to review them for you now. Do you have faith in and a testimony of God, the Eternal Father, His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost? Do you have a testimony of the Atonement of Jesus Christ and of His role as your Savior and Redeemer? Do you have a testimony of the restoration of the Gospel of Jesus Christ? Do you sustain the President of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as the prophet, seer, and revelator, and as the only person on earth authorized to exercise all priesthood keys? Do you sustain the members of the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles as prophets, seers, and revelators? Do you sustain other general authorities and local leaders of the Church? The Lord has said that all things are to be done in cleanliness before Him. Do you strive for moral cleanliness in your thoughts and behavior? Do you obey God's law of chastity? Do you follow the teachings of the Church of Jesus Christ in your private and public behavior with members of your family and others? Do you support or promote any teachings, practices, or doctrine contrary to those of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? Do you strive to keep the Sabbath day holy, both at home and at church? Attend your meetings, prepare for, and worthily partake of the sacrament, and live your life in harmony with the laws and commandments of the gospel? Do you strive to be honest in all that you do? Are you a full tithe payer? Do you understand and obey the word of wisdom? Do you have any financial or other obligations to a former spouse or to children? If yes, are you current in meeting those obligations? Do you keep the covenants that you made in the temple, including wearing the temple garment as instructed in the endowment? Are there serious sins in your life that need to be resolved with priesthood authorities as part of your repentance? Do you consider yourself worthy to enter the Lord's house and participate in temple ordinances? Well, tomorrow, these revised temple recommend questions will be distributed to church leaders throughout the world. In addition to answering those questions honestly, it is understood that each adult temple patron will wear the sacred garment of the priesthood under their regular clothing. This is symbolic of an inner commitment to strive each day to become more like the Lord. It also reminds us to remain faithful to covenants made each day and to walk on the covenant path each day in a higher and holier way. Now, for just a moment, I would like to speak to our youth we encourage you to qualify for limited use, Temple recommends. You will only be asked those questions applicable to you in your preparation for the ordinances of proxy baptism and confirmation. 
We are very grateful for your worthiness and willingness to participate in that sacred temple work. We thank you. Individual worthiness to enter the Lord's house requires much individual spiritual preparation. But with the Lord's help, nothing is impossible. In some respects, it is easier to build a temple than it is to build a people prepared for a temple. Individual worthiness requires a total conversion of mind and heart to be more like the Lord, to be an honest citizen, to be a better example, to be a holier person. I testify that such preparatory work brings innumerable blessings in this life and inconceivable blessings for the life to come, including the perpetuation of your family unit throughout all eternity in a state of never-ending happiness. Now I would like to turn to another topic, plans for the coming year. In the springtime of the year 2020, it will be exactly 200 years since Joseph Smith experienced the theophany that we know as the first vision. God the Father and His beloved Son, Jesus Christ, appeared to Joseph, a 14-year-old youth. That event marked the onset of the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ in its fullness, precisely as foretold in the Holy Bible. Then came a succession of visits from heavenly messengers, including Moroni, John the Baptist, and the early apostles Peter, James, and John. Others followed, including Moses, Elias, and Elijah, each brought divine authority to bless God's children on the earth once again. Miraculously, we have also received the Book of Mormon, another testament of Jesus Christ, a companion scripture to the Holy Bible. The revelations published in the Doctrine and Covenants and the Pearl of Great Price have also greatly enriched our understanding of God's commandments and eternal truth. The keys and offices of the priesthood have been restored, including the offices of apostle, seventy, patriarch, high priest, elder, bishop, priest, teacher, and deacon. And women who love the Lord serve valiantly in the Relief Society, primary, young women, Sunday school, and other church callings, all vital parts of the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ in its fullness. Thus, the year 2020 will be designated as a bicentennial year. General Conference next April will be different from any previous conference. In the next six months, I hope that every member and every family will prepare for a unique conference that will commemorate the very foundations of the restored gospel. You may wish to begin your preparation by reading afresh Joseph Smith's account of the first vision as recorded in the Pearl of Great Price. Our course of study for the next year in Come, Follow Me is the Book of Mormon. You may wish to ponder important questions such as, how would my life be different if my knowledge gained from the Book of Mormon were suddenly taken away? Or how have the events that followed the verse, first vision made a difference for me and my loved ones. Also, with the Book of Mormon videos now becoming available, you may wish to incorporate them in your individual and family study. Select your own questions, design your own plan, immerse yourself in the glorious light of the Restoration. As you do, General Conference next April will not only be memorable, it will be unforgettable. Now, in closing, I leave with you my love and my blessing that each of you may become happier and holier with each passing day. Meanwhile, please be assured that revelation continues in the Church and will continue under the Lord's direction until the purposes of God shall be accomplished. And the great Jehovah shall say, the work is done. I so bless you, reaffirming my love for you with my testimony that God lives. Jesus is the Christ. This is his church, and we are his people. 
In the sacred name of Jesus Christ, amen.
Our beloved Father in heaven, at the close of this general conference of thy church, we, thy saints, gathered across the world, express our deep and profound love for thee and for thy Son, for the glorious restoration of thy gospel in these latter days, for the prophet Joseph and his mission, for the succession of prophets that have continued down to President Russell M. Nelson. We rejoice in the revelations that continue to flow to establish thy church and kingdom and to transform our individual lives. We rejoice in the wells of living water that we have partaken of during this conference. We rejoice in the love that we feel, in the resolves that we have made to repent and improve each day. As the Spirit has spoken to us and committed us to act, we pray that that same Spirit would go with us to strengthen and remind us, to enable us to do those things that will help us to be better and do better than ever before, that we might become holy, that we might prepare the world for the return of thy Son. We pray for the gathering of Israel across the world and do so in the name of thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ, amen. This has been a broadcast of the 189th Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Speakers were selected from the general authorities and general officers of the church. Music was provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. This broadcast has been furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. mostly. I don't know.